before we uh, uh, go through the last speaker of the afternoon, I want everyone here to go th and appreciate the effort of uh, Megan Jordan and her team over here. <laughs> Takes a lot of work, and uh, those of us who uh, get to sit on stage are amazed how thoughtful and careful they are about all the details. But um, we're thrilled today to have uh, Rick Levin, CEO of Coursera, join us. And if you don't know Rick or about his background, it's, it's very, very impressive. He grew up in San Francisco. He went to Stanford. He wandered over to Oxford. Uh, he then went to Yale and earned his PhD in economics. I think he may have been dodging the Vietnam War at the time or something, but he enjoyed school really, really, really well. He was so prolific at Yale that they named him chair of the economics department, later the 22nd president of the university. And that's a position he held for two decades. You know, kind of a phenomenal record in academia and almost any organization. But I also think it's really critical that he accomplished a great deal of initiatives in terms of uh, increasing financial aid. They uh, developed, uh, spearheaded the effort around the first, uh, you know, liberal arts college in Asia with uh, the National Univers University of Singapore. And they saw the development of like 70% of the campus. So a phenomenal track record. But one of the benefits of having a, an economics professor as your president is his ability to access capital. And during that period, uh, they grew the endowment from 3.2 billion to over 20 billion. So quite phenomenal success. Uh, and despite the dot-com bust and the you know, collapse of financial markets in uh, 2007, 2008. So we're thrilled to have uh, Rick join us today. And I thought I might just leave out a question of, you know, given all your success, given the tremendous, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, just the, 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 you know, opportunities you've it's seen at Yale, something brought them back to Silicon Valley and something brought them back to Coursera. So share your insights. Well, it was pretty serendipitous, actually. I, I was, uh, I took the fall semester of 2013 after I stepped down from the presidency, um, at just, just sabbatical time at Stanford, where my son teaches and uh, my daughter works, and so it was nice to be out in this area. And um, during that period, I was, I just ran into Al Gore at a cocktail party. We just talked about, John Dennison just talked about Al Gore. And he said, hey, Rick, you've you got time on your hands. Why don't you come help us out at Coursera? Al was a Kleiner Perkins uh, advisor. And so the next day, Daphne Kohler, the irrepressible Daphne Kohler, who's a, a really force of nature, called me and said, you know, come on over, let's talk. And she said, and I, I resisted getting deeply involved. I said, look, I'll be an advisor to you. I'll come, come around a week, a month to, to sort of help out. Two days into that role, John Doerr is all over me to be the CEO. So it was, a, it was um, a surprise. I wasn't really looking for it. But it fit, because I'd been really interested in online education while at Yale. We had, back in the first dot-com boom, we'd done our own nonprofit startup with Stanford and Oxford um, to, to try to disseminate some of our own courses, mainly to our alumni. It was a failed technology at that time, a failed business model, but an aesthetic success, great courses. Um, and then five or six years later, when the open courseware movement started and the Hewlett Foundation started funding uh, MIT to do open courseware, Yale jumped right on that bandwagon. We produced 45 classroom capture courses, basically just videos of the lecturer giving his lecture to students. A an inferior way to do things on the, on the internet, but it, it, you know, our faculty loved it. They loved getting emails from people all around the world and, and thought it was great. So I had, I had a sense there was tremendous potential here for reaching global audiences and for you know, doing great things for the world by taking the best talent in top universities. So when Daphne came around to try to solicit membership in Coursera back in 2013, 2012 actually started, um, uh, we, we jumped on that. Yale became a partner. And so I was, I'm pretty much enthusiastic about the idea from the beginning. You cited Yale became a partner. What was the catalyst behind these great institutions to join Coursera as a platform. What was the what was the real impetus? Um, I, I think there were several. For us, it was we we'd actually experimented with this and thought it was great. And when we saw the difference between what 
Coursera was able to do with an interactive platform that where the faculty were speaking directly to the internet learner by, you know, rather than to a classroom, um, it seemed compelling. And it seemed like uh, for us, it was just global visibility we cared about and get, giving our great professors an opportunity to reach larger audiences to scale our enterprise. I mean, why should Nobel Prize winners teach classes of 15 students? I mean, it's, why shouldn't they teach 15,000 or 150,000? It just seemed like the right way to share resources. So we, had a, we started it with just sort of an altruistic motive. I think what happened is the, the top universities got involved. Harvard and MIT got involved with edX. Stanford and Yale and Princeton and Penn sort of jumped on Michigan, jumped on Coursera. And everybody else just figured, I don't want to be left out. So I think, you know, partly Daphne was amazingly successful. She recruited in the first year 85 universities. And, and we now have 140. Um, but I, I think, you know, part of it was some people really got it. Other people came along for the ride, want, not wanting to be left be, uh, behind if something big was going to happen. And it's been, a, it's been a work. It's been sort of a, a steady work over the years. I would say we have larger numbers of truly committed universities out of our 140. But, you know, whereas now, maybe now, 40 or 50 are really serious about it and really make it a central part of their institutional strategy. But there's still 100 left that are still playing with it, testing it. Can you share just some information about the demographics, the Coursarians? How many, what are their, what, what courses are they most interested in, age, geography, et cetera? Yeah, so we, we we're getting close to 20 million registered learners, uh, and they are really very globally distributed. We have uh, uh, about a quarter from the U.S., 75% from the rest of the world, 40% uh, from developing countries, emerging economies. Um, uh, the age distribution is, uh, literally from age 15 to 95, um, and, there, and there are learners of, I would say, basically three types. A small number of learners who are looking to take the next step academically, so high school students taking college courses, college students preparing for graduate students, but that's a small fraction of, of our population. The second largest fraction is uh, maybe 30 percent are lifelong learners. They're people probably like many people in this room who might want to take a liberal arts course just to learn something, just for, just for fun, just for the personal growth and edification. Uh, I think there's a large potential market there in the long run for, for retirement, you know, people in retirement or, and so forth. And then the biggest chunk, so half, more than half of our learners are looking for career advancement and they tend to concentrate age 20 to 40. Our average age of all our learners is, the, the mean is 33. Um, Median is 33, and uh, th and they are um, uh, you know fairly equally divided by gender, about 60 percent male and 40 percent female. But that's partly an artifact of the fact that a lot of the career learners are looking for IT courses where women are less well represented. You've done a lot of innovation with, for example, the University of Illinois. You announced uh, what's called the IMBA program, and I believe there's a Master's in Computer Science that was recently announced. Can you tell us, um, you know, if, if, you, if I look through the lens of an economics professor, how is that going to disrupt the market, and, and what do we see, you know, five years from now? Let me take one step back and just so people know. Our core product, the thing that's monetized to date, is basically um, s groups of short courses called specializations. That are, ver that are highly career relevant. So learn Python programming, learn Java. We recently introduced Scala by the inventor of Scala. Uh, it's a very successful. Learn data science, learn you know, business analytics, um, th those kinds of things that are effectively about the equivalent of two semester courses and they're very reasonably priced and people are using them as career credentials. This year we made the decision to go deeper and offer degree programs online. So the first two are the Illinois programs you mentioned, an MBA and, and uh, a, a computer science course. We'll eventually have a, f a full set of specialized programs in computer science. The first one will be a master in computer science with a focus on data science, which is very hot in terms of the employment market. Where, do, where is this headed? First of all, it's highly affordable. We're offering master's degrees for um, effectively $20,000 for a two-year program. This is 
way below you know, what the market price would be for an in-residence program. Second, it has a feature of flexibility. So it's affordable, it's also hugely flexible because what we do is these master's programs are stackable. They start with the specializations. So you can take the specializations which are themselves becoming job market credentials and stack six of them together and you get an IMBA from Illinois. So, so you, it, the great thing about this, think about the typical person who tries to start a master's degree online or even go back to school at night locally to try to pick up an MBA, they rarely finish, right? And so the advantage of having these stackable credentials is you accumulate credentials as you go. You don't invest a year and a half and have nothing to show for it in the end. So we think it's a really compelling concept. And we'll, it will have a s huge effect on the market for professional education as people continue in their careers because I think, you know, if you're a working in a, in a, I mean, right now you want to go back and get an MBA, you got to leave your job take a big income sacrifice by leaving your job and pay $100,000 or more for the degree. Whereas if you can stay in your job and pay $20,000, it's kind of a no-brainer. This is going to be, a lot of people are going to find that attractive. Michael Moe talks a lot about, you know, uh, this, this knowledge gap and the reason for workers to continue to, to upgrade their skills and up, upsell their capabilities. Um, do you find the corporate market is going to help spawn this? Are they going to help to use this as a talent development pool and really, um, you know, stimulate some of your activities? So that's the other big new strategic bet. We, this year, we started the year thinking, okay, we've got one core business. Let's try two initiatives. One are degrees and the other is selling into corporate learning uh, programs. And we think this is a huge opportunity. And I would say since we started approaching companies in January, we've probably talked to 150 of them, and no one said no. That is, we haven't closed that many deals yet because these, these, these are bureaucracies and they take quite a while to penetrate and, get, and, and actually get the sale. But people are finding this quite compelling. I mean, here you get something you can't get from your own internal training staff. You're getting high-level expertise from the world's best universities. You get, um, you, you get a prestige product that you can give to your employees that in part is doing the job of training, but in part is also an employee perk. Hey, you get Wharton courses right here on the job. So, so it's, it's, it, we're, we're finding a lot of salience, and we think um, you know, that we'll, uh, we'll do really well in that, in that space. Where do you, when you think of your competitive set, um, who do you worry about today? How is that going to change as you look forward a couple of years? Only way you can survive 20 years as a college president is not to worry. So, I, I, I mean, if really, if you, you, would be, you would be paralyzed if you worried about everything you could worry about. Um, we have competition in just about everything we're doing. And um, we have a broader vision, I think, of what we are than any of our competitors because we're looking at affordable access we're looking at high quality education and we're looking at career transformation, giving people opportunity in life. There are a number of competitors that are doing two of those things, a number that are doing one of them, but none that are doing all. So in the, in the career market, you've got Udacity and General Assembly doing a great job, but focused narrowly on the tech sector and, and, um, and, and at higher price points uh, than we are and less affordable. In the education, sort of access to education market, you have edX um, providing, like us, fairly low cost access to high quality education, but without, uh, without the sort of clear focus on career transformation and changing lives. So we're larger than any of our competitors, and, and um, I, you know, I think it will have, you know, we'll have to keep up and, and innovate to stay ahead, but right now I think we're leading uh, in most of these spaces. So, uh, Rick, here at GSV Labs, we have 170 startups. Um, I think some of the CEOs are here in the audience. And, and succeeding in this world is about overcoming obstacles. Can you share some of the biggest obstacles that you've had to tackle as, uh, as CEO of uh, Coursera over the last few years? Oh, boy. The, I mean, the, there are tons of them. Uh, but, um, I mean, I would say uh, we, we've clearly um, 
we clearly have um, faced, you know, in, we made, we've made mistakes like any startup. So we started with everything free. And so once you anchor to free, it, 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 it takes time to get people used to paying. Um, we we, we, a, a big obstacle was a lot of adverse publicity about the low completion rates. So we felt we really had to work on that. And we've, worked, we've done a tremendous amount of work to, to sort of make the course flow such that it's more compelling to learners to continue. And you know, we've got to the point now where from starting with five to six percent who started a course completing it, to those who are paying, now well over half complete. So, is a, is a, you know, so that, was a, that was a PR obstacle and, we, and, and a real obstacle to learners. We, we've worked hard to fix that. Um, I think, um, uh, you know, I, I'm sure we'll do, you know, the, 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 uh, there's an, another obstacle would be, you know, can we reach everybody? And, and I think the issue here is most of our content's in English and, and uh, about 80%, we do have content in French, Spanish, and Russian, and Chinese, but, but not nearly a full portfolio of learning products in those languages. And so the question is, how do you effectively penetrate international markets beyond the English speakers? We, we can easily translate the you know, subtitle of the lectures, but a truly full localization experience would be much more complex, and we haven't really figured that out yet. How to, how to do that effectively. Uh, Rick, if uh, the only thing between us and the cocktail party is us wrapping this up, I thought maybe what we would do is, uh, is uh, adjourn downstairs. There's a, uh, a reception, and we really want to thank uh, Rick for all his help and insight and leadership at Coursera. But thanks again. <laughs> <laughs>